State Representative Julie Harhart, and welcome to this month's legislative report. Um, this report is really, to me, a very exciting um, legislative report. We are going to be doing um, a segment on the birthday of the Sladington, the whole northern Lehigh area, but the borough of Sladington uh, and its 150th uh, birthday. And we're going to talk about uh, what has occurred over the years from, the, from 150th to the present and how it has evolved and all the changes that have been made, the improvements, uh, the economic development. With me right now, um, we're going to start off right now with the uh, gentleman who is with the DL DNL corridor. It's Scott Everett. Scott, do you want to give uh, the, the people your title and what you do exactly and how you're all involved in this up yep. here? Uh, well, first, thanks for inviting me. And oh, absolutely. I am uh, Scott Everett, and I am the trail manager and stewardship manager for the DNL, the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor. So my responsibility is to develop and work with our partners to help maintain the 165-mile-long DNL trail, mm -hmm. uh, part of which runs through uh, Sladington, where we're here today. I know this is really this is like really a starting point, correct? Uh, a, a good starting point if you want to ride the trails and yeah, you this want is what we consider one of our major trailheads. Uh, we put this in three or four years ago, um, and it continues to um, the usage continues to increase. So it's a really popular destination. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start here and you go down the trail, how far do you go and come around? And I mean. How, about and, how many and miles and where does it take you exactly? When this section, and I have to explain to people, the, tr the DNL trail is basically either on old Lehigh Valley rail bed or the towpath of the Lehigh Canal. And we're fortunate we're in a spot right here where the, the DNL trail is on both sides of the Lehigh River. Mm -hmm. The old rail bed here in Sladington and the towpath across the river in Walnutport uh, this section, the rail bed, is part of the 165 continuous miles. This will take you down into the cement area in Whitehall Township, which is a little over nine miles. Mm -hmm. And if we head north the other direction, it will take you all the way up until we heighten with a new trailhead that we put in there, which is right around 10 miles. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a very popular spot. Uh, people park here and go either north or south or do the entire length. Of oh, the trail on the bikes yeah. walk? Yeah, this wheelchairs, 20 miles. I hear wheelchairs as well that, you know, are, come, onto the, uh, come onto the trail as well, and yep. they can enjoy it. So it's, it's accessible for everybody. One of the, um, when we receive funding from the state and the federal government, one of the stipulations is everything needs to be put in ADA compliant, and that has numerous benefits. Um, people that are physically challenged are out on the trail. A lot of elderly people are out on the trail. They like the soft, even flat surface. Um, and I've talked to people that haven't rode a bike in years that have now, they're on their bikes enjoying the trail. Um, so it has appealed to a lot of residents who normally wouldn't have been outdoors. Mm -hmm. I know this has been a project that's been a, a around for a long time because I, I remember when um, it first started and it was like um, I have a dream type thing yes. and uh, it, I think it working with the DNL and, and the area, the, the township and the county and the state and everybody that was involved, I, I really am very pleased to see how this has come about and the time frame that this has come about and the additions that have been made. I, I love the, uh, the pavilion and the stone um, train station, is that what that <laughs> Yes. And I, I think- Restrooms, actually. And but. literally, out of all our DNL trail projects in recent years, our first project using federal money, what was called T money, was 1.6 mm -hmm. miles of trail from the north end of the Sladington Trailhead uh, north into the Lehigh Gap Nature Center. That mm -hmm. was literally our first project. And once that was completed, that kind of started the momentum to build the 9.2 miles of trail south of here, working with our friends at Lehigh County and using a combination of county and state money. Uh, we extended the trail, like I mentioned previously, all the way up to Lehighton with other partnerships and funding sources. 
So we now have a solid 20 mile stretch of trail uh, in the Lehigh Valley with more projects to come. Mm -hmm. And look, we have, well, more projects to finish or to start, or are, are they already they're, in they're progress? In, and they're in various stages. Um, the big thing going beyond the northern Lehigh section that we're in right now is getting a pedestrian bridge in up at Jim Thorpe. Okay. And that literally is kind of like the golden spike of the DNL Trail. Mm -hmm. That will connect the Lehigh Gorge State Park and Luzerne County. We're talking um, 40 miles of completed trail that would now be linked to all the completed trail in northern Lehigh and down into Lehigh Valley. Um, so that is the big thing there. The other thing is to firm up the connection in the lower end of the Lehigh Valley from Cement and Northampton down into Allentown, Catasauqua area. Right now, you know, we have some challenges with some of the funding sources and there's a lot of PennDOT bridge projects literally over top of the trail, which obviously have higher priority. So it's gonna take a few more years to yeah. get, get it solidly completed. Uh, from Northampton down Allentown. Well, funding, you know, that is a that, that is a problem. Money is very tight, but um, all good things take time. Yes. I mean, we got here. Now, going back 150 years. I mean, do you yes. think? What do you, What do you think about 150 years ago? Um, they was there a trail here, a path here, and now over the whole 150 years, how this has evolved and well, I think a one of the when, I guess. You, when you when you look back at you know it's. 150th birthday of Slatington and the trail. I mean, our trail, the 165 miles are in historic areas. Mm -hmm. So this trail literally runs through, in this case, the, um, the slate industry up in this area, the cement industry down in Catasauqua, Whitehall yes. cement yes. area, um, across the river in Walnutport was the canal. Right. Um, there's a really cool old photo of several years ago, that was taken years ago up in the Lehigh Gap a few miles north of here showing the canal, a boat being pulled by mules, um, the rail, a railroad going, a uh, rail train going through, uh, the old predecessor to Route 248, an old car, this was probably taken in the 1920s and it had all these different modes of transportation Mm -hmm. in one photo mm -hmm. and there's very few places in the country that you could see that many different modes of transportation. So there's a lot of history in this area and we've tried, uh, you'll see along the trail where we've done interpretive panels to try to tell people about the history in this area. Over the years I've seen an awful lot of improvement um, in this area. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the um, how it's uh, what kind of economic impact it has on this area, the positive econo economic impact it can have on this area. Yes, I'm uh, really proud of how a lot of different partners came together in this area of uh, Slatington and Walnutport uh, to build this beautiful trailhead. And now we're at the cusp of learning how we have all these people on the trail. How do we get them out into the businesses? of both Walnutport and Slatington. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we're working on together with these same partners. The trailhead was a pretty much a unique um, combination of partners throughout the trail where we had Lehigh County contributed money, the state contributed money, but most importantly, the pavilion and restroom facilities were put in with from a group of service organizations in the northern Lehigh area, unheard of throughout the trail. And this was not their first project. Uh, we're real near, near the Slate Heritage Trail. They put in bathrooms, a covered bridge, and a pavilion up there. And they have done amazing work. And one of the unique features of the building, it is made out of slate block. So we're normal buildings are built out of brick or stone or whatever. This is slate, which was uh, pulled from the last remaining operational slate mine uh, just outside of Slatington. So there is a nice historical tie in there. And what we've seen, uh, you know, we, people seek these amenities. The amenities are here in Slatington. 
and people get off the trail and they want something to eat or they want to explore the stores. Uh, so there's many a time I'm driving through here and you'll see people, their bikes parked outside of businesses, walking their bikes on the sidewalks, going to get something to eat. Um, I always look at that as a next phase. Mm -hmm. Now that the trail is developed, tying the communities into the trail. Mm -hmm. And Pennsylvania has tons of examples where trails have uh, sped the economic impact of some of these uh, communities that need help. Um, out west, the uh, Allegheny Passage is a good example. Locally, Jim Thorpe is an excellent example where outdoor recreation yes, is a key part of the revitalization of that town. And we're going to see that in these areas in the Lehigh Valley, that the trail will have a significant economic impact mm -hmm. on the towns. People will seek bike shops, bed and breakfast, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that is our next phase. And I'm hoping we will see that e with each passing year. Well, I think you will. And, and what you pointed on, which I think is great, is how the community really is involved with this. As you pointed out with the pavilion and the slate uh, building there. Um, and I, I'm, I, that's what, I, I mean, I represented the Sarah for quite a while, and that's what really excites me about it, is that the community is and so when, involved. When I go to state trail conferences, I always use this as an example of a partnership that, you know, in these tough economic times, right. we can't rely Absolutely. on um, state or federal money, but we can get things done through thinking outside the box, and they have done that up here Absolutely. in a significant way. Thank you, Scott, again, and I appreciate you being here and uh, being a part of my legislative report. I thank you very much. Thank you. And now we are going to be going uh, to another part of the area. Uh, we're going to be talking to uh, Christy Haight, and he is going to be telling us all about the 150th anniversary, that's a birthday that's going on up here, and um, a little bit about the history as well. So just follow me. And now we are here with uh, Christy Hay, who is co-chair of the 150th anniversary. Uh, welcome. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Christy, and, and thank you for being a part of my legislative report. No problem. Um, I think this is really exciting. This I truly exciting. do. This is an exciting week here in town. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what's going on well, here? Well, it's, it's an eight-day celebration. We're celebrating the anniversary of the incorporation of the town, which happened in 1864. September 7th, we're actually a little bit early, but uh, we're having an eight-day celebration. And we're honoring, every day we're honoring different factions of the town. Um, we're honoring uh, the youth, we're honoring the military, the firemen, uh, the people in general, the, the uh, churches, and uh, it's just a great week. It's a great week. So what, what, do you, uh, what do you think is the biggest deal about this 150th anniversary? The biggest deal is that we're here 150 years. Every <laughs> town every town has their ups and downs, and slanton has gone through that too. And uh, I think Slanton's starting to come back a little bit with our trail system downtown, yes. and uh, that's exciting. And, and uh, somebody in town has to figure out a way to get them from down there up into our business district you know, and give them a reason to come up here. So it's, it's exciting, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a milestone. It's a milestone. Well, yeah, I think you've come a long way, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you'll just keep moving forward. We will. What, uh, what is the biggest challenge in putting this whole 150th anniversary well, together? Well, it's it's changed. The town's changed a lot. The makeup of the town's changed a lot, and we often talk about this. I believe when we did our centennial in, in uh, 1964, I was 11 years old, and but at that time, I think everybody's parents and grandparents uh, came from this town, and and they worked in the slate quarries. And maybe in 89, when we did our 125th, it might have been 75% of the town. Now I bet it's about 50%. And so that's a challenge, mm -hmm. uh, money-wise and volunteer-wise and everything else. But we're doing all right. We're doing all right. And I think that's what's so important and significant is that you keep and preserve right. this right. area. History is a big part of the celebration. A big part of the celebration. And what do you hope to accomplish with this whole celebration? Well, um, we have a couple things. Uh, one thing we did, we, we opened up up in the Victory Park, and one of our goals was to get this town more interested in having things up there. And we talked to a lot of people that they were saying, oh, we got to do this every year, you know, one day up here. And uh, that's, that's one thing that's I think is already going to be accomplished. And I'm hoping with our block party, which will be right in this area from the 500 and 600 block, I'm hoping 
Somebody will see how neat of a town this is and look at the architecture. I mean, this architecture is beautiful. It, is. Uh, it was built when Slatington was, um, Slate was king, and Slatington was the state, state capital of the world. I'm hoping somebody sees something and puts a store or something, it brings some business into this town. That's one of my big goals for that. And it, to bring the town closer together, that's, that's, that's what I'm hoping for too. Those three things, I think. And, you're, and I think yeah. you're succeeding with bringing so. in the whole. We'll find out. Oh, yeah. All the, yeah, the town's coming together. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I, yeah. I, we, I think yeah. too that uh, this is going to help. Yep. I, I think oh, you're so. absolutely right. It just uh, takes time. It takes yep. time for yep. all this to uh, yep. evolve. So let's hope it doesn't take another 50 years off. <laughs> no, over here. <laughs> so um, who do you think is the most important and influential person of this late Indian area? Um, you know what? I talked about this. I did some historical wagon tours on Sunday, and that came up. And we've had a lot of famous people come through town. Uh, now, uh, for a shame, uh, a lot of the younger people don't remember Hess Brothers in Allentown. Hess Brothers, the department store. They and Mac, no, they don't. Goodness. Max Hess Sr., who built that, used to live in Slayton for a time because he married a Slayton girl. He married Millie Rice, who lived where Harding's funeral home is now. Huh. And so he would come here with his son, Max Jr., and he'd spend the summer up here. And, and he liked the area because he blended in. He was a millionaire, but there were a lot of millionaires in town. So he loved coming to Slayton. Um, and then also we had Fred Horlocker, who owned one of the original five breweries in Allentown. He had Horlockers and Newweilers and all those. But he had uh, bottling plants up here in Slayton, as other towns. And um, oh, he rented horses and he had uh, businesses down in the uh, Kearns Dam. He did ice, ice for sale and things like that. Uh, but I think the most important person that ever lived in Slayton was a Kern, and Kerns were the founding families here in town. And Nicholas Kern was the original founder. Uh, his great-grandson was Jonas Kern. And the reason I say this is Jonas Kern was the patriarch of the family when Slate was discovered. And even though all his family, and there weren't a whole lot of families here, it was the Kern family downtown and the Remailies were up here in this upper section. And all the rest of the Kerns didn't want nothing to do with these Welsh people coming over here and discovering Slate. They didn't want to lease their land out or anything. But Jonas Kern was the patriarch and it's good to be king. And he said, listen, <laughs> We're sitting on top of all this acres, they had like 700 acres that time, and we're going to lease this out to these Welshmen. And, uh, but he was smart. He made a deal that paid the Kern family, not himself, but the Kern family, 28 cents for every manufactured ton of slate shingles. Back then it was slate shingles and mantles for the fireplaces. And they got all the slate that wasn't used for that, uh, odd sizes and stuff. So that made the Kerns, not him, the Kerns, rich. So I think he's the most important person ever to live here. And that's back in the eight, middle 1800s. Other than that, you're the next person, most famous person here. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for including me. Yeah. Um, and what is your dream for Slatington now? I'm I mean, sorry? What, what, what are your dreams for the Slatington area? Well, like I said, I, I'm hoping that this helps pr promote yeah. business in, the, in this area and gets more people up and celebrate in Victory Park, which I think that's going to happen. People are talking about uh, making a band shell up there, and there's people that said, I'll, I'll spread the cement if you pay for the stuff. I'll do all the work. And so that's going to happen, I think. So that's, that's kind of neat. Well, I think, I, I think that's what makes this community really kind of unique and stands out is because the community really does pull together. Yeah, yeah. And they really do move and make it's things always happen. Been a, it's always been a voluntary, uh, volunteer town uh, from our firemen. And if, right down there's our fireman statue, you know, and that's, mm -hmm. that's the epitome of the volunteers. And then we honored them on Monday, and there's a volunteerism is alive and well in Slate. Thank you, Christy. I really appreciate um, you being part of my legislative report and for your insight. My pleasure. I thank you. And now we will be moving down to the fireman statue and we will be talking to another historian who is Dave Altricker. And uh, so follow me. And as we wrap up this uh, legislative report um, of the 150th anniversary of Slatington, uh, we want to I want to talk to uh, Dave, who is another historian up in this area. And he is going to tell us a little bit about the Kern factor, family, uh, also your family, and uh, the statue and a little bit on religion and the military. So can we start off with the Kern family? Yes. We're very proud of our uh, heritage with the Kern family. Uh, they came to this area in 1745 and basically lived in this area for 100 years themselves. But they believed in a cause that was greater than themselves. And they supported the Declaration of Independence. And they were patriots who fought in the Revolutionary War. Of our original Nicholas Kern family, he had five sons and one grandson who served in the Revolution, Revolutionary War. 
But there's another very important factor about our early settlers. It's the fact that one of the most valuable possessions they had was their Bible. When they came to this country, they had daily readings out of the Bible. They recorded their genealogy in the Bible. And it was very important to look at that uh, part of their, history, their family history. My grandfather, Anton and Laura, moved their family to 33 Dow Street, just around the corner. And the Altrichter family, like many families that have lived here for a long time, have been very active part of the community. They have, they have been active in the churches, they've been active in the volunteer organizations, in the fire companies, the ambulance, and so on and so forth. So they were part of the community that made the community work under the quality of life. Dave, can you tell us how many generations of the Kern fact, uh, family and uh, of your family, um, you know, from the time they moved in, how many generations are, have lived in this area? Well, I'm the third generation of all trickers. The Kerns, uh, I couldn't tell you, many, 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 <laughs> many uh, yeah, Kerns. There's still a lot of Kerns living in the area that, um, uh, still, again, are part of this, a significant part of this community and very proud of their heritage. And should be. Yeah. And they should be. Okay. And we also, um, a big um, historic uh, statue right. here, which is the uh, fireman statue. And I know you know an awful lot about that. Um, would you like to touch a little bit about it? Uh, growing up, the fireman's statue was always a place we could get a fresh drink of water. It was painted silver for the years that I remember it. The horse trough in the front was knocked off in 33 by a milk truck we heard. And it never really had any color until 64, until the centennial of 64, when the Barstool brothers uh, uh, brought it back to life, shall we say, and gave it color. Um, it was painted several times in between and somewhat maintained, but when I became mayor in uh, 78, the statue was starting to lean. The payments under the statue were sinking. And I brought to the attention of the council, but uh, on October 28th, 1979, the statue was toppled over by a hit and run driver. It could be in a scrap pile, now, but this community rallied around host company number one to return the statue. So within nine months, we raised enough money and had enough local support and involvement that we were able to put the return the statue on this site where it has remained ever since. We celebrated the um, um, 100th anniversary in September of 2011. Mm -hmm. I think I was here for that. Yes, you were. <laughs> that was a very nice event as well. So. Or 2010, I'm sorry, I 2000. missed it by a year. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's okay. Time goes fast. So, And also, you wanted to touch a little bit about the, the um, military? Okay. Very proud to be a member of the Alan O'Delke Post 16. Uh, we have uh, been very active in many parts of this uh, area. Everything from the Lehigh River all the way out to Berks County is the area that we cover. We put flags on 11 cemeteries and uh, we also and we hold, conduct Memorial Day services at all these cemeteries. And we also have a special service at the west end of town to remember those who were lost their lives at sea by putting a wreath and flower petals in Trot Creek to float to all the oceans of the world. Um, we remember our veterans who are in active duty. We send packages to them. We do military funerals. We put flags on the graves of over 2,500 veterans each year. And uh, the organization exists of five different uh, groups that exist under that post on there. It would be the Post Home Association owns and operates a building and manages the employees. But we have the American Legion. We have the American Legion Auxiliary, which is a women's group. We have the uh, Sons of American Legion. And we have the American Legion Riders who is our motorcycle group, and they all are very active in the participation of this American Legion program. And to kind of like finalize and pull everything together, a little bit about the religion. Okay, we're very fortunate about the, to have a strong religious community. I said first with the Kerns, um, with their Bible, 
They belong to the Heidelberg Church, the first organized religion actually started in one of the slave factories. And uh, it was a McDowell slave factory. 1847, Freedon's Church was the first church in the area to organize over the hill. The first two in Slatenton were the Calvinistic Methodists and the Bethel Congregationalists. And they joined together and, and worshiped in the same building for 10 years at the corner of Fourth and Church Street. Then they moved across from each other uh, and built churches on the opposite side of the street. And then after that, they moved off of Church Street, so there's no church on Church Street. But after the Calvinistic Methodists and the uh, um, Presbyterians, then we had the Reformed and the Lutheran and the Baptists and many other uh, denominations that have settled in this town and they have uh, been a significant part of our community. And it was a great, great program we had uh, recently at the uh, Slatenton Elementary School where uh, so well attended by, and, and I, oh, I almost forgot the Catholic Church out on uh, uh, Washington Street. But uh, all of these denominations, they participate in, uh, in the food bank, they participate in uh, uh, Thanksgiving programs and, and also in your Lenten services. And you know, so we have a, not only an, uh, the Christmas program where we gather gifts for the children, and the food bank, supporting the food bank. So all our denominations are much more than just going to church on Sunday. They reach out in this community and beyond. Uh, Dave, you were mayor of this town? Yes, I was. Okay, can you tell us what it was like being mayor of Sladington? Well, I tell you, I was, God never gives you any more than you can handle. <laughs> <laughs> at the time I was mayor. I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> at the time I was mayor, uh, we went through a transition period where many of the businesses that moved off of Main Street to Wallaport, we had an arsonist running around town burning the place down, and we had many, many problems. We had water, uh, the, the, the residents used to bring their jars of water and it was totally brown. And we, <laughs> you can't imagine all the problems that we had uh, during the years that I was mayor. And of course, one of the tragedies was the fireman statue that, that got knocked on and was actually one of the highlights of the years I was mayor, <laughs> was putting the fireman statue back. Uh, but it, it was something that I would never do again, but I'm thrilled that I did because you learn the importance of government and you learn how to read between the lines and you know what a politician is saying if you can read between the lines. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Well, I'll end with that. Thank it's you so a much. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your interview. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> You're very welcome. That's all the time we have for today. I'm State Representative Julie Harhart. If you have any questions about what you have just seen today or any other state-related matters, please do not hesitate to call my office. The numbers will appear on the screen in a moment. Thank you again. And please join me next time for Legislative Report.